Welcome to season two of the Sister Mentors podcast. For over 25 years, Sister Mentors has been nurturing the next generation of women of color leaders. Our work centers around the needs and dreams of women and girls of color in the face of deep-seated institutional inequities found in the educational system. Over 100 women and girls of color have evolved in astounding ways thanks to Sister Mentors. And with the help of Sister Mentors, they are on their way to earning higher education degrees, particularly PhDs. In this podcast, you will get to know some of the mentors and mentees as they tell me about their lives and educational journeys. These women and girls share their moving stories of who they are, where they come from, and how Sister Mentors was instrumental in keeping them on their educational paths. In this episode, Dr. Adrienne Smith shares her experience with Sister Mentors, discussing her background, struggles, and breakthroughs in the dissertation process. She joined the program during a difficult transitional part of her educational journey. At the time of joining Sister Mentors, Adrienne felt stuck as the progress on her dissertation was slow. But after some time, she connected with the group and found the direction she needed, putting her back on the PhD path. I am your host, Camila Adams. Thanks for joining me as we celebrate the bold past and fierce future of Sister Mentors here on the Sister Mentors podcast. Adrian Smith, welcome to the Sister Mentors podcast. How are you doing today? I am well, thank you. All right, first off, who is Adrian Smith? Let's talk about your family and your roots your people, where you come from? Sure. Adrienne, maiden name Porter. It's from Portsmouth, Virginia, small town in the Tidewater, Hampton Roads area of Virginia. Uh, I am from uh, the second child of two educators. Uh, My parents, my dad was a teacher, principal, mom was a teacher. And I am a wife. I'm a mother of two brilliant children, teenagers. I am a caregiver, um, and I am a proud African-American woman who loves documentaries and the arts and helping others and um, thinking about what my next uh, part of life will look like in about 15 years when I retire. Right on. Okay, so when and why did you join Sister Mentors? I joined Sister Mentors um, at a, a difficult transitional part of my academic journey. I saw an ad in a paper, and I immediately called Dr. Lewis. I think there was a waiting list, and I was quite persistent in calling her to get on the waiting list and then to transition into the group. And so I think she had some allowances for me because I was persistent, saying that in a nice way, that I needed this in my life. (laughs) I had actually finished my coursework and I had uh, finished and completed my comprehensive exams. So it was perfect for me. Um, At the time, I was in the thick of things trying to work on this dissertation. And um, here I popped up on this, you know, advertisement and called and joined. So that was back in, uh, I believe that was back in maybe 1999, because it's been a while. I finished Hmm. uh, and graduated in 2001. So this was around that time. Uh, Joined, uh, I remember, and Dr. Lewis reminds me that I'm saying roughly about a year, had not a lot to contribute to the group. So coming to meetings consistently, everybody's working on different things, discussing advisor challenges, different chapters, data collection. And I kind of was in this, place of nothing to contribute, nothing to report, nothing to help anybody else with. And that was a cycle for quite a while. I don't know what happened, but that was a cycle. (laughs) Were you progressing personally with your dissertation at all? Or was it just you weren't 
comfortable or ready to contribute to the group or what was I don't think I was progressing. So this is the time that I was about to quit. I remember writing my dad this long letter and he was very supportive of, you know, if you want to just stop now, that's fine. Uh, And I think it was, you know, taking courses, you can do that. And I, going back, you know, comprehensive exams, I successfully completed those, even though most of my peers did not. And I just have to say that was with the help of other two, three other African-American women who had been through the program before and had their PhDs pull me like, come on, you know, here are some of the things you need to know. Here's some of the possible questions. Here's how you have to address those. Let's practice writing and You know, they gave me, I don't know, maybe 10 or so questions to look at and really just think through comprehensively. And, you know, I kind of honed into maybe four or five and I was just blessed that those four or five actually were given to me. And so I just have to honor those women who uh, came to me and said, we'll help you uh, make sure you get through these comps because sometimes the comprehensive exams stop people from completing and moving on to the next stage. So I just have to say that. But I think I was in a point that I couldn't really distinguish what I wanted to study. And you kind of go back and forth with your advisors and your committee and, you know, they have their concepts of what you should do that you may or may not feel comfortable with. You have to read and study and kind of see what's out there so you can kind of think about where you want to contribute to the field. And it was just, you know, meeting after meeting. I just couldn't get my hands around it to have anything to move forward to propose. So you have to propose before, you know, what you're going to study, how you're going to study. And then you go out and do the work, collect data, do all the research, and then you come back and defend. So I went through that period, I'm, I'm sure, for almost a year. So going to the sister mentors meetings, not able to contribute, um, but still being in that space obviously did something. Not sure what mm-hmm. made the difference, but all of a sudden um, I get it together and mm-hmm. I propose. I, you know, create my proposal of my research and I do that. Uh, in March, and I defended the next March, and I graduated before all the other women who were in the group who were progressing. Oh wow! Oh yeah! Wow! Okay. So you really, you really just like sh- you. Once you found it, you I found, found it, it, and, it. and you just rocked yeah, it. Yeah, I just <laughs> went, you know, worked every day, and got it done in a year, and I graduated the next year. What was your field of study? So my field is public health and minority health and women's health. And so that's where I work now. And so uh, my degree is in public health with an emphasis in women's health and minority health. And so my research looked at obesity in African-American women and what are the social cultural factors that contribute. And back then, obesity was, you know, one of the priority areas in public health. And I wanted to see what contributed to obesity in African-American women, but also from a cultural perspective, how do men's perceptions of bodies, women's body sizes, Mm. and African-American men's perceptions of body sizes contribute to obesity? And then I wanted, and then I kind of broaden it out, like what are all those different factors, exercise, uh, heredity, uh, chemicals, resources, resources, all of those things. So I developed, I did a couple things in my research. I developed a framework that kind of looked at all of these components. Um, And then because I was collecting data from African-American males, I had a sociocultural instrument that kind of identified their uh, cultural or racial identity. So how, in fact, they connected to African-American culture 
that they have a different framework or perception of women, African-American women's body sizes than if they didn't. And so I looked at that from two different environments and men who went to a historically black uh, college or university and men gotcha. who went to a predominantly white uh, college or university. Uh, and then I also created an instrument. So it was kind of three components. I was working with kind of three different departments. And so I uh, appreciate that because now, you know, anytime I see a questionnaire or a survey, you know, I can just like go through like they didn't give everybody all the partic- all the options. You know, this isn't a good questionnaire to get to what you want because you didn't even answer the questions and ask the questions in the right order or this should have been open ended. You know, I, I kind of look through hmm. a survey and see if it's a sound, soundly formatted because of that. And so I had all of those components in my research. And just looking back now, 20 plus years later, I mean, I could take that in a, another direction. It was so age appropriate. But, you know, you look back now on research mm-hmm. like eh, so many more things <laughs> that I could do or I would definitely deconstruct and reconstruct it in a different way. <laughs> well, well, the whole thing is fascinating, just even how you went about doing it. Um Wow, that's a really that's an interesting topic. Um, you had mentioned that you you know you wrote this long letter to your father that you were ready that you were going to quit. What was there any what contributed to that feeling? What, how, why did you? Want um, it? You know, it was you're in your tw- I was in my twenties, and I went from undergraduate to. I got a master's degree and then I went straight on to get the PhD. I remember standing in the line, graduating, getting the master's degree. And, you know, you meet and you chat with, you know, those in the line, the graduation line and folks have jobs and they're talking about everything they want to do. And and I just said, you know, they asked me and I'm like, well, I'm going back to school. And they just kind of look like, are you kidding me? You're going back in for this. (laughs) So I just kept going and, um, it's an isolated kind of experience in your twenties. Folks are adulting, buying things, doing things. And I'm stuck, you know, in this efficiency writing all the time. So I'm like, Hey, is it worth it? You know, I can't really get into the final stage. I did, guess I just had a moment, but you know, there was a shift yeah. and um, you know, we went forward and, and I proposed and defended with my parents there and my brother <laughs> in the room. Uh, so that was something that we uh, experienced together. That's amazing. Um, so it was just, it wasn't anything um, in particular that snapped you back out of it. That was like, okay, this is, it's working. I can figure it out. You just can't, it was just a moment that you had that was passing. And yeah, I don't, I can't remember kinda, what, you know, it was almost, it's overwhelming. <laughs> you know, I can't figure it out, but then it's that sometimes I think about, and I didn't hear this back then, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And so something yeah. so big that seems, you know, overwhelming. And so if you just start yeah. at it and so maybe I started at it, but I don't recall what it was, but I do think that being in the environment around others, the other women moving forward, talking about, you know, things that they were dealing with, uh, progressing in their writing, kept me (laughs) at least there to say, you know, I'm not going to totally give up, even though that's what I'm saying. And, you know, let me just kind of shift my mindset and, and work it out. So, so you didn't have a specific mentor when you were going through, but was there anybody in particular that kind of that you recall helping you or was it just, you know, just the whole group? I think it was the whole group. Um, seeing others just kind of working through their writing uh, and just talking about the dynamics of an advisor and uh, your committee. Um, I just think I shifted my communications with my committee to really focus on what it is I wanted to study. And I began writing 
and I called experts. And so outside of my committee, thinking about those experts in the field, I know Dr. Sharika Kumanyiki, Kumanyika at UPenn, I think she's at UPitt now. I, I mean, I called her almost every week uh, to get advice. And so, you know, you just kind of looked up people and called. And so it shifted based on my environment. Yeah. So was what, first of all, what school were you attending? So I attended the University of Maryland College Park and I moved there. So I went to Norfolk State University. Um, I had a minority applied science scholarship, Denemus uh, scholarship um, there. And my whole goal was to go to medical school and become an OBGYN. I worked for an OBGYN in the office and I stayed with her some and kept her kids. And when she had to leave out all times of the night and even her office work, my ideals of that shifted. But I was always still interested in health. So biology major, chemistry major, supposed to take the MCAT, but I just never took it. But I went to Hampton University and got a degree in nutritional science, which opened the door to public health, the wider array of understanding public health, behavior, health behaviors, health promotion, which medicine and science still fits in that uh, realm. Uh, and then I did some research. I worked for WIC and did research on male's perception of breastfeeding. Maybe something, maybe there's oh, some undercurrent of, of getting male's perceptions on women's health uh, and how women's health is impacted by their environment. Um, and so I looked at that based on the uh, women we would see in the WIC clinic and how their male partners uh, and also their mothers were influencing them to breastfeed or not. When you joined Sister Mentors, what was it, what was the feeling being surrounded by so many other black academic women? Uh, the diversity of the group was new, but I think at that particular level, um, I guess I expected that. I've always been around academic excellence. And so my friend group, my high school is a predominantly uh, black historic high school. I see Norcom High School in Portsmouth, Virginia. We all wanted to be in an honor society. We all knew, you know, we wanted to go to college. Whether these things happen or not, we all had these aspirations. My parents were educators, but they didn't push, you know, people would think they would push, but they didn't push um too much on that. No, they didn't. And so I got an academic scholarship for undergraduate. I went to, got my master's and I didn't pay. And I got a minority scholarship at the University of Maryland. And I actually had a dissertation scholarship. Uh, a woman at the University of Maryland, Mabel Spencer, her daughter set up a uh, a dissertation scholarship for her at the university because she received her uh, dissertate uh, her doctorate from the university. So, being around, I think I'm the only. I was at that time the only person on both sides of my family that had a PhD. Although now there are plenty more. Um, but it wasn't new to me. Uh, it was almost like expected, uh, but 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 yet, I I honored the diversity of the group and the perspectives and the fields of study, and so that was um, more enlightening to me. I think just the diversity of the group. How would you say that being a part of Sister Mentors helped you? 
it helped me because I realized that the, you know, I, I would often kind of look at Dr. Lewis, like, why is she focusing on the PhD? You know, what, what is this, you know, it's, it's just another degree, right? You know, why is she pushing this for women of color? Uh, but I think it showed me that, and I guess in my career experience, it's a door opener and it, it opens those doors to then um, provide other opportunities, not just for you, but for others. And so I look at the PhD as a rigorous journey of critical thinking and study. And so I often said, you know, this was just to let me know how much I don't know. Because the more you open uh, an article, a book, read more, you know, didact another study or something, you realize there's even more. So you can keep asking, but why? But why? And you just keep going and going and going. And there are multiple answers to that why, not just one. Um, so, you know, I think just the emphasis of the group helped me understand the need to think. And I feel like from it, not just from the PhD, but from how we discuss things and and just kind of peel back layers to really get to what we're trying to say, how we're connecting to the field. I feel like I've learned more about me, but also how to be a critical thinker under any circumstances. So I don't have to necessarily know or be an expert in the content, but I can listen enough to ask some critical questions to get to the simplest form of what you're trying to say. Um, because of our interactions and because of how we had to talk about the dissertation and also just the coursework process. How did you come to choosing your dissertation topic? Well, it seemed as though since I have this, I was, I've always kind of integrated who I am. I'm a, I'm an African-American woman. So what are the health related topics that pertain to me and people like me? And then I intersected that with a nutritional background. Like what does, so weight, body image, that's a part of the nutrition field. Um, but then also there's a social component, like public health really involves those social determinants, those things that impact health outcomes. And so it was kind of like a blend of that, like what's happening in society? What does culture tell us? You know, how do we perceive things, behave, think, influence to then impact health and health outcomes? So it was kind of like, I, I think conceptually, I wanted to blend all of those into one. And again, obesity at that time was one of the more prominent topics. I mean, I could, you know, so many things now. I've worked for 20 plus years in violence against women, human trafficking. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on with different topics that if I had to do a dissertation today, I would probably do it on a, some different topics and different social contexts. And so I think it was just that combination of thinking of those themes that got me there. Did you eventually participate as a mentor with Sister Mentors? During, yeah, I, during the time of our sessions, I had two mentees. Uh, middle school young ladies, and I think one kind of had her little sister tag along, and so I did have engagements with them. I often wonder what you know how they're doing now, but you know along the way I've had uh, informal mentors. I've had some you know through church, and 
But I think now I often say I'm a mentor because even some of the younger professionals, you know, I'm trying to encourage them go back to school or here's some of the ways in which you can navigate the federal government. Um, so I think I'm constantly doing that in an informal way. But during the time, you know, we had some men- mentees that we actually work with um, closely and I appreciated that time. It's, it's, I mean, that relationship, having someone to, to talk to, to outside of your parents and your family, it's, it's golden. And I say that now because I have children and I know that others can pour into mm-hmm. or say the same things I say and yeah. they get it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, that village component, you know, it makes a difference. Yeah. I just remember how excited the mentees were at the graduation ceremony I had. And so I was glad that they were able to come and participate during that time. Again, I was, you know, once I started and I proposed, it was almost uh, a year to the day that I, I defended. I mean, it was, you know, take no prisoners kind of thing. Um <laughs> And so, yeah, I I just remember them being there um, and just having, you know, the different uh, and there were other mentees there, too, from some of the other sister mentors. You know, that's important to me. You know, I work for the federal government and I know when I started working there, uh, I kind of shied away and I didn't. And, and I kind of still don't introduce myself as Dr. Adrian Smith. I don't do that. Mm-hmm. Some of my colleagues will say, mm-hmm. will introduce me. And sometimes it's appropriate in the setting. And I say that because I was around a lot of people who were kind of puffy about it. And I didn't want to be like them, you know. Mm-hmm. And so gotcha. I'm like, well, if they see my name or they see credentials on a piece of paper or, or an agenda, I don't have to say that. I mean, it's there. And so I kind of, um, not in any um, shame, but just kind of, I'll introduce myself and it seems it'll come out when it needs to, that sort of thing. And so I've been like that. So I had to speak at a girls conference in South Carolina, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, took my daughter down and they had maybe four or 500 girls, middle school, high school girls from all over the state, Atlanta, they bust them in, and it was one of the conferences that we sponsored for my office. And so I had to go down and speak, and they introduced me um, as Adrian Smith. And so when I started talking, I corrected them. And I'm like, you know, I just want to say, you know, they had some other, you know, like local celebrities and different people there. And so I kind of stopped them. Like, I just want to say, you know, uh, that I'm Adri- I'm Dr. Adrian Smith, and it's no boastful thing, but I felt like compelled to say it in that instance because there were so many girls of color there, and I just wanted them to see mm. me and just kind of reflect and just think, you know, a possibility in their life, whatever, you know, not even knowing whatever kind of doctor I am. I just wanted them to hear that, right. see me as a moment in their lives that, you know, hopefully could make a difference. Um, So there have been opportunities across life to be in a mentorship capacity, whether it be official or not. But that was just interesting. I just remember that story. And my daughter was there. And so it's interesting. Mm -hmm. My daughter has come with me. She's 18 now, but she's come with me to conferences for work and you know I've tried to figure out her career before she does and she now corrects me (laughs) but one thing that she said recently that you know now she's a freshman in college she said two things she said you know when we were trying to make some college selection she said that I want to make sure I go to a college that has a five-year program with a master's degree so that helped us narrow down and she said and then I'm going to get my PhD. So, hey, mm-hmm. drop the mic. That's all I needed. 
because, you know, (laughs) uh, she understands and wanted that, uh, not just for the legacy, but I, you know, I think for the critical academic um, um, influence that she has, I mean, there are a world of possibilities with, you know, this particular degree opening doors and things that she could do. All right. And that's, that's amazing. Um, it, and it also sounds like you are, that's kind of, that was your goal as well. Like, it seems like you're, you're about it more for the experience of the, the education that, you know, getting the PhD as opposed to just like the kind of like the end result, because, you know, you, you mentioned that you had questioned like why Dr. Lewis was always pushing the PhD and, and the fact that, you know, you say that you just, yeah, you just kind of like go with it. Sometimes I'm doctor, sometimes mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, it's <laughs> as to where you're introduced. So it's interesting. Um, because I feel like it's, your, it's like, like I have the fortitude, but I also have the aptitude to position myself Even if you don't know, I can speak to things and I can think at that level if needed. Right. So, and it's all for you. I guess it's beyond the title. Mm -hmm. It's all for you. Exactly. I don't know if you guys are you in the area, would you suggest um, sister mentors to your daughter? Oh, absolutely. I've given the information to many women over the years to call Dr. Lewis uh, because you just need that. I mean, we have support groups for everything. So uh, why not something that's fairly taxing and you need, you know, not just kind of emotional support, but people who understand, you know, when you talk about chapter one or a defense or, you know, data collection or statistical significance, you need others to kind of help you think through. But also, what are you trying to say? What are you adding to the field? And so not just being in the environment, but that technical support is critical as well. What does your what does your career entail today? So I work for the Office on Women's Health within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I am the director of the Division of Policy and Performance Management. So what that means is I lead and manage and oversee and coordinate programs that uh, are to help improve health outcomes for women and girls across the lifespan. And so I mentioned, you know, my work in violence against women across the years. Um, There are just so many topics. Uh, I coordinate with an office that, uh, the Office on Trafficking in Persons. So because of the large number of women and girls who are trafficked, uh, we have um, programs of prevention and we work with the secretary and the assistant secretary for health and the surgeon general Uh, And that's sex and labor trafficking. And again, uh, very much impacts women and girls of color. Uh, Violence against women um, and all of the different components of that. Uh, Thinking through women's mental health, uh, maternal health, what that looks like across the board. Uh, I have worked for WIC, as I mentioned, as a breastfeeding counselor, so trying to promote breastfeeding in minority communities. And so there are a number of women and girls health topics that we focus on uh, first to influence and inform policy, but then also to improve health outcomes. And so we can, so we can see that in the data, but also in lives and lives that are changed wow that is that is a lot that is very heavy how do how do you how do you kind of how do you cope through that how do i cope i cope because i get to see the difference and so i struggled i worked for local government before 
And I was all around town, you know, in communities, doing work, seeing, touching people, you know, that sort of thing. When I started working for the federal government, it is federal. So there's more papers to push and, you know, permissions and clearances and those types of things. And so it took me a while to just shift my thinking of, is this making a difference what I'm doing? But, you know, then when you have federal dollars that you can help uh, ensure that they get into communities, you can develop grants and contracts to make sure the work gets done. You realize that there are others, there, there are others out there who are doing the work, who are trusted in the communities, uh, and you can help support them. And so over the years, you know, I'm excited to say I've met so many people, but I've contributed to funding a lot of small organizations, minority organizations, women-owned organizations, minority-owned organizations to do work. And sometimes it's two people in the kitchen who are doing the work, but they have the reach. They know what's happening and they provide intel to us. I really want to just focus more on young women uh, in college. College is an age where time where most women are younger, adulting, young adults. They're learning uh, academically. They're learning in preparation for careers and moving forward. But that's the age in which, uh, the time frame in which they could be shepherds and champions for their families, but also when we can help ingrain some health behaviors and understanding about your health physical, mental, social, all of that in early adulthood. For instance, I mentioned lupus before. We found years back that a lot of African-American women were being diagnosed with lupus in college um, because in some places or some instances of the stress of college. And so just thinking about, you know, we talked about obesity, how you eat, how you behave, your sexual health, you know, well, how this comes to play as you are becoming more independent, uh, but also as an adult. And so thinking about women and girls across the lifespan so we can help prevent the occurrence of chronic diseases or other conditions later on in life. I, I find it very admirable and I, I'm also in awe of people who really have like these careers that just like, ah, matter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean... <laughs> I am uh, I'm extremely proud of you that, you know, the fact of like, you know, just seeing you in the space and this is what you're doing with. I think the Sister Mentors program serves more than just the women and the girls. So we often talk about the health of a community stems from the health of the women, not even the children, the women. And so uh, I think that her vision to pour into women and girls, but the, the women in the group to pursue the uh, their education is a means to um, stability in the community. And so I wish this could, like, you know, she could expand nationally and have chapters and, and that sort of thing, because um, I think there's a larger theory around, you know, education, um, mobilization, economic and and social stability around women. And, and so I think that, you know, it will provide and will continue to provide a platform for women to be in those pioneering and, and leadership positions in all types of fields, just based on the diversity of the group and diversity of study. Um, which is an example for those, you know, coming afterwards, but also just kind of 
leading in communities. And so I appreciate the support. Support is important. And so I appreciate that in, you know, a very vulnerable and critical time. For more information on Sister Mentors, a project of Educeed, please visit sistermentors.org. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn as Sister Mentors. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts, and don't be afraid to share. This podcast was produced by Rugged Angel Productions for Sister Mentors.